Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Doing a little solo time here. So I want to talk to you guys about uh, something that I think is going to resonate for a lot of people. You know, as you're listening to me and, you know, whether you've been in my world for, you know, this is your first podcast, thank you very much. Uh, or this is, you know, episode like 700 for you or you've been listening and going to my stuff forever. One of the things I like to talk about is just being competitive and my question for you is, are you competitive? So as you're listening, like if you're driving in your car right now, I want you to say yes or no. Like, are you competitive? And I acknowledge like there's two kinds of competitive natures. There's internal competition and there's external competition. You think about uh, some of the most iconic people when you think about the word competitive, you think of like the Michael Jordans of the world, they would say like, you know, he would like want to compete, like even playing cards, playing golf, like everything for him was a competition. That's very external competition. It was always him versus someone else, right? Him versus whatever team they were playing. Then there's that internal competition, which is like me versus me. And I don't think there's a, there's a right or wrong formula. I think it's important for you to understand which one drives you. And, and if you say to me, you're not competitive at all, um, I, I would argue that you're probably suppressing, uh, some emotions, some demons that maybe something happened to your past that you're like a little upset about. Um, because I think to survive on this planet, you got to be competitive, right? Just to be human in these times, right? I'm looking at, you know, Ian, my producer, like you just got to be competitive, right? I mean, I could be like competitively, like who's more in love, me or my wife. Like there's a lot of ways that we can compete. Um, but I bring it up to you because there's, in the real estate space, there's a lot happening right now. Um, being in this industry as long as I have, uh, it, it becomes apparent when you take a step back from the last 19 months, 20 months dealing with the pandemic, depending upon where you are in the world. You know, I think about our clients, you know, in Italy and, you know, all over the world that were dealing with it long before many of us in North America were. When you, when you take a step back and you look at what's happened, um, not only the convergence of new technology, new innovation, Zoom became like every day, like, you know, your grandparents are on it, everybody's on it. We've had, we've had this like, uh, we were forced, if you will, into the digital transformation of our home life and our work life, right? Like people just became, because they had to, right? Like they became more competitive in that space, more understanding of that space, more compassionate in that space, more leaning into that space. But I wanna talk about the impact of the real estate industry. I think there's two phrases uh, that if you're taking notes, you should really connect with this, write it down and understand. I'm going to talk to you about a deep dive of the MLS, the multi-listing service. When I was talking with uh, a very good friend, Pat Veeling, he runs a company called uh, Real Data Solutions. They're like the go-to for aggregating like hyper local MLS data and then looking nationally at what's happening with real estate agents and teams to the point that I could call Pat and say, hey, could you give me, you know, client X, agent X, and he can tell me, is that person's business ascending or going down, right? And where do they rank in their MLS? All of this is important because if you, if you look back over the history of real estate, certainly as long as I've been in it, we hear these phrases like the 80-20 principle, Prieto's principle, uh, that you know 20% of the agents doing 80% of the business. And you know, for as long as I've been in this industry, that actually wasn't true. Does, does that shock you as you're listening to this? That for as long as I've been in it, it actually wasn't true. It was more like 80% of the agents did like 20% of the of the business. Like they all did one, two, three, four, five. And you know, of course, there was new agents. There was people that were fading out of the business. And yes, there's always been top producers, but we never had um, like that true 80-20 principle in our industry. I've just never seen it. The data never showed it, right? But now today, I'm going to reveal for you some some data points that. Uh, I think you're going to find interesting. I think you're going to you're going to probably do a little like me versus me, like how am I doing, and then maybe how am I doing in comparison to the other agents in my marketplace in terms of ranking for volume and GCI and transactions. But I want to take you back to sort of the bigger point. If you look at the sort of data around transactions, it would be hard for us to argue that the consumers didn't go for what I call the flight to quality. That Maybe it's the convergence of so much information available now on our iPhone that like, you know, before I make the, biz the biggest, you know, financial decision of my life to buy this house or to select an agent to work with me that I might like go online and Google that person and see if they have a Google My Business page, see how many reviews they have, look at their track record, look at their listings and sales, maybe go to Zillow, maybe go to Yelp. I'm going to do all these things today because that's normal today. 
So when you look at the data that I'm going to share with you, there was a massive flight to quality. Consumers were choosing to not just go with Sally or Ted, their neighbor, their friend. Instead, they were choosing people that were more successful, had done more transactions, and the data just reveals it. It just becomes obvious. So the flight to quality, how do we get you in the way of that? How do we get you more business? But the other one is, when I look at the agent population, and, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty blessed. I get to talk to a lot of people online, offline. I, I was doing live events over the summer. I do a lot of, you know, just Q and A with people. And, and what I'm seeing also is like this flight for certainty, like the flight to certainty, like people are, they want to know if I do X, can I count on Y? Like there's just not a lot of room for error right now. And when you look at the data that I'm going to share with you, it's pretty apparent. Um, the winners are winning at a really high level and they're taking massive market share. And one could argue it's because they're running plays that work. They're doing what they know works. And, and I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of that stuff, but I just want to set the tone for you. Like, have you seen it? Have you seen a flight to quality um, in everything that happened over the last 19, you know, 19 months? I was chatting with a friend of mine. Uh, I'm a part of a uh, spirits company, wine, tequila, bourbon, et cetera, with a legendary guy. I'm just happy to be a part of the deal. And, you know, he's just a genius and I was happy to invest in him. And I asked him, I said, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, what can we expect as an emerging brand, like an emerging branded real estate agent or real estate company going through this market? He said, you know, the tendency when things get a little sour or strange or uncertain is people flight, they, they go towards the name brands, right? The, the people that have always been out there, the brands that have always been out there. And we certainly saw the same thing in real estate based on the data. But the other one is the flight to certainty. And I want to just stress to you, like, as we sit here, whether it's, you know, when you're listening to this, we're under 100 days left before the end of the year. 100 days left. So we've had 265 days, 265 days for you to look back and say, how did I do this year? Did, did I run plays that worked? Did I make my phone calls? Did I do my marketing? Did I generate enough leads? Did I go on enough appointments? Like, did I put enough energy into my business? Was I being competitive in my marketplace or not? And then you can look forward and say, okay, for the next 100 days, what do I want to do? Right? What I'm seeing more and more of is people are looking for certainty. People want to know, hey, if I do X, can I generate Y? Does that make sense? So stop for a second and just like, again, I'm asking you, did you see the flight to quality? If you look inside your MLS, do you see the way I describe it as the rich getting richer? The people that are successful are doing even more business, right? And then for you personally, are you in that same situation where you're like, I don't have time to mess around, man. Like, tell me what works, right? Tell me what works online. Tell me what works offline. Give me the best scripts. Give me the best hacks. Give me the best approaches. Give me the best direct mail. And I'll just do that. That's a flight towards certainty. So let's talk about the data. Uh, big shout out to, again, Pat Veeling over at RDS. Um, I went to him a couple months ago and said, I'd like to know. My hypothesis was, again, that I'm watching my clients just explode. Our coaching members doing so much more business and brokerages that, that I consult with doing so much more business during this time. And of course, you know, you could argue that a lot of agents, certainly in the you know, early stages of COVID last year, took a, uh, an unpaid vacation. Like they just checked out. They were in a complete state of uncertainty and absolute fear. And I said to people, look, the people that are winning right now are the ones that like looked into the fear and said, I'm going to make the phone calls anyway. I'm going to do the right thing anyway. I'm going to reach out to more customers. I'm going to make more phone calls. I'm going to be of service, not always in a sales mode. In, in many cases, not at all in a sales mode, just purely a, Ian, I sold you and your wife a house. I just want to check in and see how you guys are doing, right? Like those kind of calls. And it was the people that like, you know, from COVID to cold calls, got over their fear and moved forward. Those, my, those guys and gals are killing it right now. So let's talk about the data. I asked him for it. Here's what he gave me. You ready? So as of right now, if you go trailing 12 months and you should do this in your own MLS, right? To, to look at your numbers. Cause I'm taking an aggregate of, of a bunch of the top MLSs in the country, you know, controlling a large swath of, of the U S here's what we're seeing. The top 1% of agents right now are doing 17% of all the volume and GCI. So if you say there's 1.6 million ish agents in the U S that means basically 16,000 agents. Funny enough, that's about the same size as the America America's best list uh, with my partners over at Housing Wire, right? Tracking the top, you know, call it 15, 16,000 agents. The top 1% are doing 17%, right? If you take the top 5%, including the top one, they're at 37% of all the volume, 
all the transactions and all the GCI. So on a national level, you're talking about 80,000 agents essentially doing 37%. Like that's a lot of business amongst a very small group of individuals and teams out there dominating. So then I went out as high as 25% and said, if you were just in the top 25% ranking of your MLS, there's 10,000 agents and you're in the top 2,500, that group today, that group today, ready, controls 73% on average of all the volume, all the transactions, all the GCI. Now, remember how I started this podcast when I said, are you competitive? So as you're listening to me, there's probably one or two things that are going through your head. You're either like, man, I got to pull over right now. And I got to go into the MLS and see where I rank. Like, how, how, where am I in this mix? And, and many of my top clients, like, it's funny when I, when I bring this up to people, not funny, it's fascinating. They just go, oh yeah, I'm number 16 out of 4,000 agents. Like they know it. They know it because it matters to them, right? It's because they recognize the same thing you and I recognize, which is there's very little competition at the top. There's very little competition at the bottom, but there are some competing factors, which are all these other companies that are marketing better than you to your own customer base, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So top 1%, 17% of all the volume. Top 5%, 37. And these are all like 17.2, 37.9, right? But I'm just giving you the, the basic number. 73% of all the transactions in volume, 73% of all the volume and all the transactions and all the GCI by the top 25% and the top 50%, right, are doing 91% of the volume. So I started talking with Pat about this and, and we're going through the numbers and Pat's been doing this for a long time. He's very well respected as, as sort of the, the aggregator of all things MLS data based on agents. And as we were going through this, he's like, you know, Tom, what's interesting is today a consumer that was thinking about buying a house, maybe a first time buyer, maybe a, a person who's selling their house for the first time in 15 years and, and they've completely lost track with their agent. And that person, right? The question is, are they more inclined today to do research, to go to a Google My Business page or go to somebody's Zillow profile or, or realtor.com or whatever it may be? Are they more inclined to do that? The data certainly says they are. And here's what Pat said to me. He said, think about it like this. If you just look at the math and say, consumer today looking to buy a house, looking to sell their house, they have a 68% chance of going after an agent and saying, hi, I'd like you to help us. And that 68% chance is a 68% chance of working with someone that's done zero to maybe one or two transactions, one or two, two max in the last 12 months. Now, if you're listening to this and you're a brand new agent, you're like, oh, that's me. Okay, I, I get it, right? You're getting started. We're gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna give you some insights and things I want you to do. But I want you to understand as a brand new agent, like <laughs> there's not a lot of competition. It, it's not in the bottom 50%. One could even argue it's not even in the bottom 75%. The real competition begins when you get into that top 25%. So as a brand new agent, you wanna know. As a veteran agent who's been doing this for a long, long time, thank you for listening, I love you right? Thank you for your service and all that you've done for the industry. I challenge you to say at this point in your career, is that where you should be? Is that where you should rank? Really? Or should you be doing more, right? With the size of your database, the size of your reach, how much time and energy? Yes, I'm priding you. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm challenging you here. I want more from you. The consumer wants more from you. So here's what I wrote down. If you hear those numbers, the, the obvious question is like, where do I rank? That's first and foremost. But the second question that I'm asking people is, do you see this trend continuing or do you think that we'll go back to a more normalized, everybody does a couple deals and a few people do well? What do you think? Like my argument is since 2015, I said total team domination is one of the most important trends happening in real estate. I was talking about it in 2015. My dad and I were talking about it back in the late nineties. In the early two thousands, we were teaching it, talking about teen concepts, but by 2015, it just became apparent that good agents would say, wait a minute, I'm really good with clients. I'm a really good listing agent. You know, <laughs> I need to surround myself with a marketer, uh, someone that can manage transactions beautifully, maybe a showing agent or two, and they just exploded. And when you look at the numbers, right, the top 1%, top 5%, top 25%, it's hard to argue that any one of them doesn't have an assistant, maybe two buyer's agents, maybe 30 buyer's agents, right? Like, it's very obvious that's the direction it's gone. But do you see a change? Like, do you see a change? Now, someone will say, Tom, what about iBuyers? 
you know, I, I keep hearing all these high buyers and, you know, in some marketplaces they're doing phenomenal. Look, from what I can tell, if you go back to the interview I did with Mike Del Prete, big shout out to Mike. At that point, it was like 0.5% of all the transactions uh, had been done via iBuyer. And if you if you pay attention to what we talked about there, and, and a lot of a lot of this is just his his you know years of analyzing this, that risk aversion is a major factor that's going to stop the vast majority of people from doing that. I know I'm bouncing a little bit here, but I want to address it. That risk aversion is what's stopping people from from selling their home on their like phone, if essentially like sure. Amazon, buy a book, no problem. Book an airline ticket, eh, some people will, some people won't, vast majority will. But like selling my $400,000 house, yeah, I think I wanna get an agent, right? And most of the data says that's gonna happen 90% of the time. So, so take that out, just the 90%. Do you think the trend is consumers will continue to flock towards people with great track records, excellent branding, position themselves well, have clear and obvious you know, degrees of separation, know how to market themselves, great at following up, running a business like a business, or do you think they're gonna to go to Susie or Ted or Maria or Juan and say, hey man, I know you haven't done any deals this year and you're driving an Uber most of the time, but sell my house. I, I'm just arguing that I think that the trend is gonna continue. What do you think? So then if the first question is where do you rank and the second question is what trend you know what trend are you sort of betting on where do you think the market's going then the obvious question is what should you do what should you do see i think it's going to become even more competitive at the top and again it's going to be competitive because Ian's a great agent and Sally's a great agent and Swapnil, who was in my office a couple of days ago here in Dallas is an amazing agent and i'm a great agent right like we're all going to compete right but the bigger also competition that we need to factor in, that you need to be thinking about, especially under 100 days left this year, thinking about next year, is the 30 plus companies that are out marketing you, building bigger brands, positioning themselves differently, maybe offering discounts or something else to get those consumers, the people in your database to call you. Like, I think that's the real nig, uh, next big competitive play for you. So it's one thing to say, where do I rank? Hey, I'm 15, I wanna be in the top 1% or top 7%, awesome. On the flip side, there's a dragon out there that I need you to start thinking about like, how might you wanna slay it? And I, I don't mean that you're gonna take out Rocket or Zillow or Open Door or any one of these major players. My point is, they're going to do a lot to get as many people as they can to go to their website, to send them over to their real estate agents, Better's got agents, Redfin's got agents, Zillow's got agents. They're all playing this game now. What are you going to do to be competitive? So, so the thing that I keep writing down with my clients, and it's kind of giving you just kind of high level here, just in a short podcast, the stuff that I'm thinking about. Like when I, when I think about Maxine Gellens in La Jolla and Marty, her daughter, who are you know two of my longest personal coaching clients. Twenty two years we've worked together. Maxine's eighty three years old, and like she, like every time I'm on the phone with her, it's like phone or Zoom, she's just a breath of fresh air. Like she's so innovative, and 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 Marty's such a smart business person. They're such great negotiators. They're so consistent with their marketing. They continue to win. I think it's because of three things, and it's the same three things that when I look broadly across the most successful men and women we work with around the world, Michael Polsler in Europe or John in Sydney or Maxine Gellens in La Jolla. It's three things. It's ambition, right? Ambition drives them. Like they truly believe they can do more, right? That they wake up every day saying, you know, I did good yesterday, but I can do even more. Like they're ambitious. Like, like, they see the $90 billion commission play in real estate. They look around and they're like, wait a minute, that person on TV did how much? I can beat that person, right? Such and such in our group got over $400 million or they did $800 million in sales. I could beat that person. Like they just fundamentally believe that. They don't always know how they're going to do it, but there's this competitive, ambitious motor in them. So maybe one question for you as you think about the last, you know, whatever, 265 days and staring down the next 100 is, what can you do to amplify your ambition? What can you do to unlock some of that competitive juice, that fire, that energy. Some people need an enemy. Some people need a dragon to slay. I have uh, plenty of clients. And I have to be mindful of saying names because like the two people I'm thinking of are actually uh, very successful and very well known in the LA marketplace. Um, but I'll just say one of my clients, he was the number three agent in his marketplace. 
And he comes to me and he's like, okay, coach, like I am so tired of losing to Hama Hama and Nana Nana. And I'm like, okay, cool. You want a dragon to slay? Let's get after it, man. And we made it our mission for like 18 months to basically go from three and then we got the two and then we finally eked out one. It took us three years, but like he, he was driving himself to be number one. It was so important to him. And be clear, he's a beautiful relationship. Obviously, it's a guy. He's a beautiful relationship. He's got a great relationship with his kids. He's in great shape. He plays a lot of golf. He's a lot of fun. But when it came to business, it was game on ambition. I want to be number one. Where do you want to be? Even just in the simple uh, thought of ranking in your MLS, are you okay being number 997? Like, are you good with that? Like, all the money's at the top. Right now, one of you is going to check out, like someone's just going to go, God, I don't even want to hear this. Like, this is just stupid. I don't, I don't want to be on that level. And my response to you is you are probably suppressing again, something that happened to you when you were a kid. Like I, I can't wait, by the way, I'm looking at Ian Ian, I'm going to interview, I would argue top 10 greatest therapists alive today will be in this studio in November, right? So I'm not going to say his name, but I'm going to tell you that he did, he's done 40 years of therapy. He did 15 years of four hour a day, seven day a week, call in radio show therapy in four minutes or less. Like he is a genius, right? So he and I were chatting today. He's one of my mentors, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm saving it. So just be ready when it comes and you're going to be like, oh my, he's Yoda. Like that's the best way to describe it. Like of why human beings do what they do. And, and we talk about it all the time, like, oh, I want to go for that, but I'm not. And it's always like, oh, when I was four, I wanted a pony. I didn't get it. That's why I'm not going to make my phone calls today. Like, it's always these like completely bombastic stories. You've got a story about ambition. You've got a story about competition. I would ask you to search your feelings, Luke, and, and maybe just maybe allow yourself to go for it a little bit. Like, just to go for it a little bit. Like, you're going to die. Do you get that? Like, this is, this is such a random thought, but like, do you get that? Like you're gonna die. So on your deathbed, name a person you've, that you love. And I think about my father-in-law who passed away just a few years ago. I think about my, my grandfather, right? My dad's dad, like, you know, two very city, my mentor, Bill Mitchell, I could cry just thinking about it. Like these, these men that you know, impacted me and so my, my grandmother, Liz, right? Like one of the big, by the way, one of the greatest real estate agents in Huntington Beach, California from like 1955 to like 1970. She retired. She got a Trans Am, a black Smokey and the Bandit Trans Am. She was single. She would come over, the T-tops were off and I'd be like, Grandma, can I go for a ride in the Trans Am? Like it was, it was awesome, right? These, these men and women, like I, I think of just those four in particular, they lived like they lived, they weren't waiting, right? None of them are on their deathbed saying, gosh, darn it, you know, I wish I would have. They all wanted more time. Make no bones of that. Every one of them wanted more time, but all of them were like, I gave it my all. Like I went after it. This is a strange time in this world. There's two kinds of people right now, people that are going for it and people that are just afraid. I'm asking you to like, allow yourself, allow yourself to think big again. Allow yourself to dream. Like, think about like when you were a kid and you were like, anything is possible. Maybe it was like coming out of college. Anything is possible, right? Like when you first got into real estate, anything is possible. Like I did a coaching sessions on Monday and I, was, I, I did a post, if you saw it uh, in my Instagram stories of like the dollar volume of like the eight calls that I had that day with these eight different clients, I, the, the median, like the average was like $300 million in sales times that by 2.5% in gross commission income. Some of them have teams. Some of them are just luxury agents. Like these men and women are making more money than they ever thought possible. Are they more special than you listening to this right now? Like, really? Like, do you think they, they were raised with a silver spoon in their mouth. Do you think they went to Ivy League schools? I can't even think of like, did any of them go to college? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like they're all batshit crazy, just like you, just like me, right? But they allow themselves to be ambitious, to dream. But there's a second part of that. The second part of this obviously is in, uh, inside of ambition, it's about getting exposure to people that have been there, done that. Remember the flight to certainty is, hey, just tell me what to do. I wanna just do that. Like we're seeing that nonstop. I see it when I look at the, the heat map of my own website. Like people are like, give me the scripts, <laughs> give me the checklist, give me the tactics, right? Like tell me exactly what to do. 
So maybe, just maybe, you'd seen another role model. Maybe you need to go into your MLS and look around and see who's the most successful agent or five or 10. And look, you're not going to be BFFs with all of them. Who cares? I think you should. I think agent-agent relationships really matter, especially when you're in negotiations and just because we're all you know in this together. But if you just start observing what they're doing or you call us and say, hey, can I observe somebody outside of my marketplace? I want to find out what the best person in you know Manhattan, Kansas is doing versus New York City. Like We can make those introductions and you can go observe these men and women. You know what you're going to see? They run very similar plays over and over and over and over. Their schedule, their systems, their marketing, their branding, it's all like... It's all basically the same. They, they figured out their way in their market for their type of client. They want more sellers. They want less buyers, whatever it is. And they run those plays. You, you get that. And then you start realizing like, hey, if that gal can do it and that gal can do it and that gal can do it, I can do it too. Ambition. Here's the second thing. Branding, marketing, and lead generation. When you look at the top 25%, especially because of our work with, so, so Ian, I don't know if you know, we, um, I partnered a long time ago with a guy named Steve Murray, who is created a company called Real Trends and they would publish every year and then I became part of this, like half owner of it, the top 1,000 agent and teams, right, across the U.S. based on transactions and volume, right? So four different lists of 250, the volume side, right, and then the transaction side, individuals and teams. And, and when you get to know, as I do, so many of these men and women, they are all brilliant and consistent at putting out their message branding themselves. And I don't care if it's billboards, direct mail, bus benches, grocery stores, shopping cart, you know, things, uh, you know, full page ads, Google, Facebook, buying leads off Zillow, truly a realtor. They do it all right because they recognize it's a noisy, noisy, noisy environment. And you can't be a secret agent and expect to be one of the very best. You've got to put yourself out there. So maybe as you're again, thinking about 2022, ask yourself, what can you do to amplify your brand? What can you do to get on the largest consideration set of buyers and sellers and potential renters or investors or whoever you want to attract in your marketplace in 2022? I mean, the amount of content we put out on this, you could just literally just stay here on my YouTube channel or wherever you're listening to this. If you're listening, go just go right in and just type in like marketing, type in Jason Pantana. And Jason and I've had infinite numbers of, of content conversations around everything from YouTube, YouTube ads to YouTube B-roll ads to creating your own show and then maybe doing it live on Facebook, doing it live on Instagram, the power of reels and on and on and on and on and on. The point is this, it's only going to get more competitive. You're going to compete in the top 25% and then you're going to compete against all these other companies that are running television, radio, making sexier offers, more provocative offers, discounted rates, blah, blah, blah. How are you going to compete? You're competitive. How are you going to compete? So branding, right? And ultimately that really comes down to like not only getting the word out, but then of course managing the funnel, right? Top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. And again, we can talk for days on all this, but I'm just, I'm just trying to set the tone. What do the top 25% of the agents in the MLS do that maybe you're not? One is they're definitely ambitious. They decided to be there, right? They didn't, they didn't just wake up mad, just go in and go, how did I become number one in my office? No, they were like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to kick ass and I'm going to make it happen every single day. And bam, you know, three years, five years, seven years later, it happens, right? But they set the intention. The other one is marketing, branding, and lead generation. And make no bones about it, whether I think about Andy C. He started when he was a brand new agent. And like he was a brand new agent. There was like, it was like cold call, man. Like that's all you got. You cold call, Fizbo's expired and let's see what you can do. And he, you know, sold a couple houses and he did okay. Then we kind of realized he's probably more of a face-to-face -face guy. Like he's just like, if you understand your own DNA, like if people are coming to him, he's good. I'm like, well, let's do open houses. We can do open houses seven days a week. And he becomes wildly successful doing open houses. And it was about 10 years ago. He's like, okay, coach. By the way, this is Andy C, TSE, uh, Intero Real Estate in Silicon Valley, right? So you can Google him and you can see his success. And he actually just got named for 2020, the number one team in all of Silicon Valley and uh, like $598 million in sales. Like he's just, he's an absolute rock star. He's massively competitive. He's got a ton of ambition. He's got four kids, right? Like he's got a lot of life going on. So, you know, he wants to be successful. He wants to win. He wants his kids to win in soccer. And like, you know, it's the whole nine yards. Marketing and branding. 10 years ago, he calls me and he's like, okay, coach, open houses are really working. My past clients in Sphere are working, but I need another source. And I'm like, look, 
direct mail. And he's like, oh, I can it's always funny when I say direct mail because people are like, oh, imagine 10 years ago in Silicon Valley, direct mail. Oh man, the internet, that's where it's all going. Okay, I understand, but, but check this out. Direct mail is one of those plays that we know just works. And when I look across every person that I talk to that does a massive amount of business, direct mail is always in there. Geographic farming specifically. We pick a couple thousand houses. I forget where it was, maybe, you know, probably um, Saratoga, you know, something like that in, in Silicon Valley. And he nails this area and he starts, you know, doing two direct mail pieces every month and it's not working and it's not working and it's not working. And you finally say, I'm going to quit. And that's immediately when someone calls and says, hi, let's list my $2 million house and I've been getting your direct mail forever. And it's only been like three months. You're like, yes, thank you. I'll be right over. And, and then, you know, fast forward, I don't know, maybe two, two, three years later that, um, every door direct mail EDDM, the U S post office launches that we're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I can now mail massive numbers right? And get it out because it's not going to be like that bulk mail stuff that they used to just throw away. But instead, this is the U.S. post office. This is their solution. And we literally, we just start amplifying the number. Why? Because it worked. Why? Because we sent stuff out and we got phone calls and, you know, you start doing open houses plus a direct mail and your database and these other things. And all of a sudden, he's a celebrity in his town. Well, now he's doing like 125,000 direct mail pieces a month, right? So marketing, Branding, lead generation. Here's the point. No wrong way to do it. You got to have a balance of online and offline because all those companies that I'm referring to that are coming after your database, most of them are going to be television and online. Television and online. They're not going to have the boots on the ground. They may not do direct mail yet, but they probably will start. Are you competitive? Are you going to get after it? The last thing is the word discipline. Discipline, discipline, discipline. So Ian, my producer, you're hearing me say yo to, and we'll have to get Ian on camera, you know, soon. We were talking about earlier. He's like, hey, are you tired? You're just airplanes, this, that. I'm like, man, it, does, it doesn't matter. I just get up and I do my thing and I get up to kind of the same time every single day, no matter what. And we talked about sort of 4.45 in the morning for like 20 straight years before one of my buddies was like, you need to sleep more. And that's a whole other podcast. But it's about, it's about setting your, your life up to be a little more disciplined, so execution, follow through, making promises and fulfilling on them becomes the norm. So I don't know, I don't know a wildly successful person that's unreliable. Do you? How many, how many wildly successful people do you know that are like, oh man, she's amazing, but you can't really count on her. <laughs> no, that, like, that wouldn't even make sense, right? So, so when you think of discipline, what comes to your mind? Like you listening right now. What do you think when I say discipline? Um, does it mean I got to get up at 445 in the morning and like, you know, oh, I go to the gym and uh, you know, maybe that's it. Like maybe for some people, discipline is just getting up at six and walking their dog, right? You get to decide what the rules are. You get to decide what discipline means to you. Um, I though, I'm a fan of like, when I find myself in that, I don't want to say rut, but like that plateau is a better way to describe it, right? So it's the J curve that uh, my buddy, Dr. Jerry Jellison would always talk about that you start out here if you're kind of watching visually, or if you're just hearing me, just imagine like I'm on this cliff, right? And, and I'm standing on that cliff and I'm dreaming about what's possible next year, but what's possible next year is way up there, right? I'm, I'm here at level X of performance, life, business, finance, whatever it is, and I'm looking up there and I want to just go from here to there. But the bummer is the, the, the J curve tells us that I must first jump off the cliff, go down into the valley of despair, and then start working my way up to success mountain. Like that's how it works. So when I find myself in that plateau, and by the way, the way he describes a fulfilling life the same way he would describe, by the way, he was an adjunct professor at USC. That's where I actually met him and just a brilliant guy. We should get him on the podcast too. Um, when he described it to me, he had it visually like almost like a, like a good stock, just constantly going high and right. But there was always a dip before it went up and then it plateaued. And then there was another dip and then it went up and then it plateaued. So when I said to you in a rut, really, really what I was saying is when you find yourself in that plateau, right? When I find myself at the edge, looking up at a new goal, it's the recognition that what got me here is not going to get me there. So what's the new discipline I need to take on? So 2022 becomes magical. So 2022 becomes, oh my goodness, I was able to achieve all that I wanted to achieve. And the reason why I like the pit of despair is that's like the first 35 days of your new discipline. 
right? So let, let's just say today you said, oh, I'm gonna try a physical discipline. I'm, I live in the Northeast. We're going into the winter months. It's gonna be cold. So maybe going for a run every day is probably not the highest and best or, or not, not my thing. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna ride the Peloton bike for 30 minutes every day. Or I'm gonna do 100 push-ups every day, right? Like 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups. I have a buddy of mine that does that. He's like 65 and he's ripped. And he's been doing it for like 10 years, right? So you say, okay, I'm gonna do it. Well, the first day you do it, you don't get any healthier, right? You're not suddenly like yoked or feeling great. Like it's like the first, you go, I'm gonna make my calls every day to my database, five to my database, five new people, four lead follow-up. I'm gonna do it every day between now and the end of the year, no matter what. The first day you do it, you're like, ah, and you just feel like, why am I doing this? Okay, I did it a second day. Why am I, do I'm not getting any results. I'm doing the push-ups. I'm making my phone calls. Whatever the discipline, it's not working. This is not working. Why am I doing this? And then, by the way, as you're going down, you look up at your goal and you're like, it looks like it's getting farther and farther away as you go down into the discipline despair before you slowly start to pull out and you're 15, 18 days in and all of a sudden you're like hitting this little stage of momentum and you're like, my back doesn't hurt anymore and I'm doing these push-ups or, hey, I'm finding myself on the Peloton bike and I'm riding faster and I'm riding harder and I'm breaking a sweat quicker and I'm like, wow, I'm really getting into this. This is great, you know? Or, hey, I'm making my phone calls and I'm getting all these leads and appointments and this is really starting to work, right? That's what I'm talking about when I say discipline. That's what the best people do, right? They don't try and change everything on a Thursday. They don't go, you know, I'm a free spirit and I don't ever follow a schedule, but tomorrow I'm getting up at five, then at 5.05 I'm doing this, and 5.10 I'm doing that, and 5.15 I'm doing this, and 5.27 I'm doing that, and then I'm going to the bathroom, and you know, like, no. I'm gonna have a morning routine that works for me, and I'm gonna do like these four things. And I'm just gonna see if I can do that. If I can do that for like a month, that's awesome. Then they're gonna add to it. Now you might be saying, while you started this podcast by saying you're just gonna have a quick little conversation with us about being competitive, what I want you to understand is this. There's a massive flight to quality right now and I want you to be that agent. I want you to be that team leader. I wanna have you be in a position where more and more of those customers are finding you online, offline, because of the reputation and the brand that you built, because of the marketing, because of your ambition and your desire to go out and serve more customers, to make a bigger difference for people, and ultimately that you're willing to be, be disciplined and follow through and execute, because that's what consumers expect today. So that's my message. All right, as I wrap it up, because my wife is out there, so I do have a bounce. That is, by the way, my next appointment. How good is that? Like, that's the best appointment ever. Thank you so much for listening. Give me some comments. Give me some feedback. I know I was bouncing all over the place here, but remember, competition, ambition, branding and marketing, and discipline. That's how you win. See you guys soon.